Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Warmly welcome to this event. My name is Anna Carolina Marciano. I'm a program officer at SWATBIO at Stockholm Resilience Center. My work has a particular focus on small scale artisanal fisheries issues, but also I work uh, at the interface of human rights and biodiversity conservation. During the past two years, I have been following the conventional biological diversity process and engaging with the sweat bio network process uh, with the sweat bio network of partners in supporting the integration of human rights based approach into the framework. Thank you and welcome. Hello everyone from me too. My name is Stephen Wojniecki. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Thematic Studies at Lynn Shepping University. Uh, my research is about incorporating the social dimensions of uh, global and environmental change, such as climate change and biodiversity loss. I'm also a fellow and author of the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, we're going to get used to some acronyms in this session, but try to reduce them as much as possible, avoid all the technical jargon. Uh, I work in the um, Transformative Change Assessment. I'm also a research associate at the Nature Based Solutions Initiative at the University of Oxford. So it's a really great pleasure and a privilege to be able to co moderate with Anna. And we've got such a fantastic uh, panel for you. We're so grateful that they've lent their time to this event. Um, we really look forward to hearing their insights and reflections and also hearing from the audience as well. In the coming hour and a half, we have about 170 people registered for the event. So it's really nice also to see this growing interest in biodiversity issues. Um, we really aim for this to be an accessible event. So to keep the language accessible to people that aren't necessarily familiar with these kinds of policies and uh, negotiations and so on. And then before we begin, we just want to uh, take a few moments to send our thoughts and prayers um, to those suffering from the terrible and tragic events in Turkey and Syria. Thank you, Stephen. So um, in today's session, we will take the opportunity to unpack the CUM in Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework which countries have just signed at the UN Biodiversity Conference COP15 in Montreal. We want to pay special attention to the outcomes and strength of the framework as seen from the diverse perspective of the panel that we have here today. We will be asking what will take to achieve the goals of the framework and in so doing ensure that it acts as a pivotal moment towards arresting the threats to nature upon which we all depend on. So this event is brought to you through the collaboration of the following organizations, which is FOCALI, the Forest, Climate and Livelihood Research Network, hosted by Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development, Siani, the Swedish International Agriculture Network Initiative, hosted by Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, CSPR, Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Linköp University. And SWATBIO, a program for biodiversity and equitable development at Stockholm Resilience Center. So, in a moment, we will introduce our expert panelists, but first, Will will begin with the short setting the scene to give you a sense of what has led to the signing of this agreement. We are delighted to bring together a diverse panel of experts, each of whom participated in the Biodiversity Conference in Montreal. After setting the scene, we will listen to our panelists' highlights of the process of the negotiations and discuss the outcomes, the strength, and all the challenges of the global biodiversity framework. Then we want to hear from you, from our audience, about your views on taking the new GBF forward. After that, we'll open a second round of discussion where our panelists from their diverse standpoints as very active participants in the negotiation will reflect on now and the future. 
Then we will close with an opportunity for the audience to ask questions to the panel members. So uh, let's start now. So I would like to call my colleague Stefan to introduce our setting the scene section. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Anna. And yes, what we'd like to do before we begin the panel discussion is to give you a flavor of, of what has led up to this moment, um, you know, to provide some basic elements of the context that helps to make sense of uh, what is going forward, looking into the future. And to do that, we've invited Koji Miwa, my friend and colleague from the IPES Transformative Change Assessment. Um, Koji is a policy researcher at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Japan. His current focus is on the conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services, blue carbon, sustainable tourism, and disaster risk management. Koji is also a fellow, uh, like I said, in the IPES assessment on transformative change. So Koji, please take it away. Thank you, Stephen, for introducing me and thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so, as Stephen uh, mentioned, my name is Koji Miwa. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. So, I'd like to, to uh, share the uh, background of today's uh, discussion. So, next slide, please. So, first, why do we care about biodiversity loss? So, as you all know, nature is essential for our life. It provides fresh water, food, pollination, soil, medicine, fisheries, Climate regulation, disaster risk reduction, art, spirituality, relaxation, and many other unmeasurable things. So, it is called ecosystem services in the scientific field. And as it, nature provides not only the uh, positive things, but the negative things like natural disasters, uh, we also call it nature's contribution to people. Next, please. So first, uh, history of the CBD and IH targets. So CBD uh, is Convention on Biological Diversity entered into force in 1993. It's a multilateral treaty and its objectives are uh, the convention, uh, conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of comp the components of biological diversity and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. So uh, COP is the conference of the parties. It is a governing body of the convention and advances the implementation of the convention through the decisions made at the periodical meetings. So COP10 was a PENS meeting held in Aichi, Japan, and it set the strategic plan for biodiversity, including IG biodiversity targets. It was adopted for the uh, 10 years uh, period from 2011 to 2020. So we assess the results of the progress at the end of the uh, period, and then we figure out that none of the targets was fully achieved. Next, please. Therefore, uh, we, there's a need of ambition. As the uh, biodiversity targets has not been fully achieved, it means that we really, really facing the urgent issues. The IPBES uh, published a global assessment in 2019, and it says about 25% of animal and plant species groups, uh, 1 million species are threatened, with extinction, and many of these will become extinct in the next few decades if appropriate action is not taken. And our societal values and behaviors are fundamental factors of, for these issues. Therefore, it says transformative change across various sectors is needed. Next, please. And this uh, last year, IPBES also published another assessment, which is a methodological assessment of the diverse values and valuation of nature. So global assessment said values is, uh, and it's, 
uh, one of the fundamental factor. So it means, so in the, this assessment, it made a bit more clearly. So and this, until now, we have focused on the short term or economy oriented values. And from now on to make transformative change happen, we need to shift it to the sustainability aligned values, putting sustainability at the heart of decision making. So on the right hand side, you can see the many bubbles. Those are focusing, those are values focusing economy, like short term or profits. And the green parts are more focusing on the sustainability. But until now, we have always look at focusing on these uh, blue bubbles. So to make transformative change happen, we also need to transform our established norms and legal rules. And we also expect it to facilitate policy uptake so that policy can uptake uh, those kind of more sustainable values. Next, please. However, uh, we have, we faced some difficult issues in the last a few years. Uh, as we faced the COVID-19, uh, COP15 was delayed. It was supposed to be held in October 2020 in Kunming, China. However, uh, due to this the pandemic, it was delayed. And then finally, December last year, uh, it was held in Montreal, Canada. And then the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was adopted. So that means we have only seven years left to achieve the new framework and targets. Uh, next, please. So, um, so that's all my presentation. And then uh, the panel discussion will follow. So thank you. Thank you so much, Koji, for sharing your knowledge and for setting the scene for us in such a nice way. So you were at the COP15 and you've also been attending various conferences in the past, right? Uh, partly through the Japanese delegation and otherwise. So maybe you could just give a quick flavor of what it was like to be there. Did it feel like a historical moment? Mm. Uh, so as a researcher, um, I'm often supporting the Ministry of Environment of Japan. And well, it is very fascinating to see how the negotiations goes and then what which country want to defend this part or don't want to use this term and so on. Sometimes it's difficult to understand why you want to bracket this word or you want to do this and so on. So, however, finally, we when we reach the point that we all agree, it is a very great moment. And then, and the four researchers, it's also interesting to see many uh, different points of view from around the world. And at COP, we also meet many different researchers around the from around the world through the side events. So this is a uh, very uh, not only negotiations but also all these interactions going on alongside, which is very uh, interesting. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Anna, it's over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Koji. So uh, now is the moment for our panel discussion. So we would like to introduce the, today's panel. So we have Charlotte Sirkvist. Senior Advisor, Division for Natural Environment, Minister of Climate and Enterprise, Government Office of Sweden. She's also Sweden's CBD Chief Negotiator. Uh, we also have Amelia Arigin Prado, UN CBD Women's Caucus Coordinator, Anna Axelson, and Senior Policy Specialist and Coordinator Biodiversity at Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, CEDA. And Ramson Kamushu, he is a research learning and advocacy manager at Indigenous Movement for Peace, Advancement and Conflict Transformation, Impact in Kenya. And we have Pranila Malme, 
Senior Advisor at Sweat Bio at Stockholm Resilience Center. Welcome all the panelists. So um, I'm going to start. Um, now we're going to move the section on process and outcomes of the Kumi Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So I will start with Charlotte. And Charlotte, we understand that you were the co-chair of the SBI, the body that assists in the assessment and review of implementation of the convention, but you also had of the Swedish delegation. So on your perspective as a policymaker, could you please share some of your reflections and highlights about the process of negotiation, but what are the strengths and challenges of the new global biodiversity framework from your perspective? Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, and hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Sörqvist. I work at the Minister of, Minister of Climate and Enterprise in Sweden. Uh, and first, I also would like to thank Kodi for setting the scene for this uh, panel discussion. I think it's very valuable to start with the science and the knowledge we all share that we need to, to do something to, because we have an ongoing biodiversity loss. Uh, so, I'm happy to be here today and share some reflections, both from my, my work as chief negotiator and head of the Swedish delegation, but also as, as you say, uh, a chair of subsidiary body implementation. I have been, I must say that um, it has been a long journey that really, I was really happy when it ended in Montreal. It's not, it's just maybe one month, it's one month and a half since we actually that night in Montreal and the deal was still, we, we had concluded our discussions. So it's very fresh and um, as I said, I'm, I'm very happy about it. So first, if I will start to say something about the content and some of the reflections. Uh, Sweden, as you know, as part of the European Union, ha had been very active in, in the negotiations for a long time, and uh, we have several priorities before COP15. For us, it was very important to make sure we have a sustained ambitions framework that was science-based, that will help all parties to stop and reverse the loss of biodiversity. And uh, for doing that, we need a change that uh, is transformative and we need goals and targets that cover all areas we need to take action. And, but it, we, we cannot only have a goals and targets alone, we also need to have a clear monitoring and framework for review and uh, planning. So that was one thing that was quite important for us to make sure that the package, finally package deal also have enough uh, text and decisions on a planning report interview. It has been said before, but I think that um, at the final stage of negotiations, a lot of things were discussed. I mean, we have had negotiations, as said before, for four years in different areas. It was a really challenge to have this balance and we didn't know exactly what could be done first because you'd have a parallel discussions at the final weeks in Montreal and uh, even if I think all of the participants share the, the ambition to have a, an ambitious framework, you, you could have different um, priorities when come to the need for different aspects in the target or in means implementation. So when they had the final deal, it was really, it has to be seen as a package deal. It was six decisions, the GBF itself, the global biodiversity framework with goals and targets, of course, maybe the most important thing, but at the same time, we also have a decisions on the monitoring framework. We do have a decision on the planning reporting and review on resource mobilization, capacity building and digital sequence information. All those decisions has to be seen together as a package deal because that, uh, it was presented as a package and it was decided as a package. So even if um, I can see that, uh, well, I'm happy, I'm happy about the outcome, but I also of course can see that things that maybe we would like to have is not there, but, uh, but on the other hand, I think maybe it's a compromise, always, uh, always when you have a, a compromise, it leaves everyone in a similar state between happiness and unhappiness. So I think it was a good compromise and I think it has been seen as that as well. Regarding this process, uh, 
And as I said, I mean, I have, I was elected as SBI chair 2018. I thought I would have this post for two years. And as you know, because of pandemic and uh, we need to have, a, we couldn't have our physical meetings. It took so long time. We started off to have a more virtual meetings and try to find ways how we can continue our important discussions because it really was, we felt we were in a hurry by each targets, uh, they only have a deadline in 2020. We needed to have something else. At, at the same time, how can we communicate and have our negotiation when we cannot meet? So we have a, a long period of virtual informal meetings, and then it was a little more formal informal meetings, and uh, it was to have a, a virtual meetings that was as close as formal as possible. And finally, we met physically in Geneva in March last year. So it took a long time. But on the other hand, one thing I have seen as chair SBI is that in the beginning, less parties were involved, but more and more parties start to speak, have time to prepare. All those webinars, all those preparatory events, everything, I think it was some kind of capacity building for all of us. We learned more, we listened more, and actually I really could see that it was the, the speaking list was far, was really long, much longer than and, and it has been before in, in physical meetings. I, I heard the secretary told me that we're not used to too many parties wanted to speak. Not only parties, also other stakeholders are involved. So, well, hopefully this long process of preparations, even if we maybe have a, are more in a hurry to fulfill our targets. Hopefully, this long process will help us also to have a more involvement. And, uh, and, and that, of course, will be something we need to continue with. Um, and another thing I would like to, to raise is regarding this uh, preparation that I can see that, uh, and maybe some of our panelists will comment on that as well, is that for some items where we've had good preparations, both in this virtual informally within the CBD meetings, but also in other kind of webinars and preparatory events. I can see that those decisions was much well prepared and we could have a decision, like the gender plan of action, for instance, one. But for some other items that maybe we didn't have so much intention, we didn't have time to prepare it, it was more difficult. So I think we learned something from that that is it important not only to have our discussions in the formal scenes of, a, of a UN negotiation, but also in all these areas around the stakeholders can speak and prepare and learn from each other. And then of course, you have to fit it in in the formal negotiations. So that I think is something I want to keep for the future. The strange of this GBF is that it is inclusive. Most targets are measurable, even if so, as I said, I think I missed some of them. It could be more measurable than others. And we also have uh, the decision resource mobilization and um, other means of implementation of planning report and review. But the challenge is we have very little time. Uh, and we don't have uh, all the indicators, for instance, we, that we need for having a an, an, um, follow-up. So as I see, as a challenge ahead, of course, is that we we have things we need to continue in this intersectional period before next COP, uh, and it's not that far away. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very happy to see all the active inclusiveness in this uh, framework, and that uh, I think we have learned a lot, something we can learn and keep for the future. I think I'll stop by that. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Charlotte. So um, following up and also highlighting the gender plan of action and also the gender equality perspe perspective and the rights perspective, I would like to call uh, Amelia with a similar question. So Amelia, you have been coordinating the Women Caucus, the major group that negotiate for women's rights and gender equality. As well, you also have been engaged with the youth network previously. So on your perspective, what would you like to highlight about the process of the negotiations, the outcomes, especially on the rights issues, the gender perspective, and also with the youth lens? What are the strengths and challenge with regard to these issues? Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you so much to be part of this panel. I would like to start saying that, yes, the COP15 was a historic moment, at least for the women's side, for uh, the gender equality and women's empowerment advocacy, because we make history by having the first time uh, an, an a real convention having a gender equality target. You know, like it is the first time we, can, we have seen this in the environmental sector. And now we are, we are proud of that because it's a big achievement itself, but also a big uh, commitment and a big uh, task to, to take ahead. And, uh, but if I would like to highlight something from the process of the negotiation is uh, something that is, it, it, it didn't happen only during Montreal. Like the negotiations, as, ma as many have mentioned, it, it has been a process of four years at least. And that for us to be able to have the target 23 and the gender plan of action and many other decisions is because all of these items started to be negotiated even during COP8, or during the previous COP, not the COP14, sorry. And that's why, because or during these four years, during the regional and the thematic consultations, all of these topics were we dedicated time. There were many specialists involved. You know, like there are many spaces, many uh, parallel consultations that even the given organized the women's we organized our own consultations. We were part of all of the the in parallel processes, not the, the submissions, the peer reviews, the informal groups, the formal groups, not like it, we try to make our best and to engage as much as possible in all of the consultation, in all of the negotiation process. So we were able to achieve what we achieved at COP15. And also to highlight in case someone missed during COP, we also have uh, for the first time a gender day at the CBD because it, this, is, uh, this has been a momentum in some other uh, environmental uh, agreements. But for the CBD, it was the first time that we had a dedicated program to discuss or to analyze more in depth how gender is related with the decisions that were going to, to, to be taken during the COP. And we also have a ministerial breakfast, meaning that the, the interest on gender issues were also taken into the higher levels of the negotiations. So because in some other COPs, maybe the, the gender issues were just like something, um, like just an, an asterisk, not just something like it was there to be discussed, but this time it made even through a, a ministerial breakfast. And in terms of the negative or the, the, of the areas to improve is that, well, we know it, we know this from our national perspectives. Not like necessar not necessarily the ones that are negotiating are the ones that are going to come back to our countries to implement. So we really need to make uh, and to improve that bridge between the negotiators and the implementers' authorities mainly. You know, like because some of the ones that are uh, that are really aware about what has been discussed, what has been agreed, and the pros, the cons, on, on, or why we make those decisions are not necessarily the same people that are back on our countries are making the, the, the local decision or implementing. And if I would like to also share which are the strengths, of, the strengths and challenges of the GBF per se, I can, say, I can talk enough about Target 21, Target 22 and Target 23 because we know that Target 21 is focused on access, you not know, like public access to information, to available knowledge, for the, to make it available for decision makers, for practitioners and for the public. So we can have equitable governance, integrated and participatory management of biodiversity. We're talking about this uh, target that we need to engage all people in all of their positions in society to be able to, as Koji was mentioning, to make this, uh, this, this framework a reality in only seven years. Now we don't have a decade. We just have seven years to make all these targets uh, a reality. Target 22, where it comes into indigenous peoples and local communities, and for our side on the caucus, we, have, we see this as a great achievement because it, it says specifically that it, all of the indigenous and local communities' issues should be dealt from a gender-sensitive 
participation and representation. So meaning that women, local women and girls and indigenous women and girls should be taken into consideration. All their uh, special and particular situations must be taken into consideration. And obviously the, the cherry of the cake for us is the Target 23, that apart from having the gender plan of action will, that will guide in concrete all the implementation of the GBF, we also have a, spe a specific and st standalone target on, on gender equality that must recognize the differentiated and uh, in the recognition of the equal rights and access to land and natural resources, the full and equitable, meaningful and informed participation of women and girls in all engagement, policy and decision making. And to, to, my, to my perspective, there are many, many gains uh, in, in the in the GBF from the from the human rights approach from the rights of nature you know, the, the, the specific mention to to mother earth and, 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 and its rights the specific mention to a gender intergenerational equity to the full and effective participation of youth of transformative education like we really make and we were able to agree on a really really transformative framework that we need all of us, all of different stakeholders, all of different, um, all of different uh, people on different positions to make it a reality, as I was saying. And I will, I will leave it here because for my side, there are many gains and many positive outcomes to focus on. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you for strength. Uh, thank you for highlighting all the strength and pointing out the target. Mention the intergenerational uh, equity, but also uh, talking a little bit of the challenges on decision and implementation. So, taking on that, I would like to move to Anna. So, Anna, you're responsible for a government assignment that aims to strength see this operation in terms of integrating biodiversity and increasing support for the protection and restoration of biodiversity. So you also have supported the government on issues related to the conventional biological diversity, such as resource mobilization. So what, what, what would you like to highlight about the outcomes of the negotiation from the perspective of development cooperation work uh, in biodiversity? Like what are the strengths and the challenges that you, you see? Thank you. Thank you, Anna, um, and hello to everyone. Um, well, as you said, I, I do work at CETA with biodiversity, but I was part of the Swedish delegation to the negotiations. So in this discussion, I'd like to contribute a little bit about the outcomes in, in terms of resource mobilization, which was the, the issue that I, I followed during the negotiations. And um, I mean, what we have uh, is basically, like Charlotte also mentioned, uh, we have the GPF, which sort of describes the the what of resource mobilization, but we also have a, a related and associated decision uh, on resource mobilization and the strategy, uh, which, which describes sort of the how of, of uh, um, resource mobilization. And what we're really talking about, of course, is the money, uh, which is going to make it possible to, to implement uh, the GBF. And in terms of, of process, uh, it was, it's quite contentious uh, negotiations. Uh, it always is when it, when it comes to money. I think uh, quite polarized, a little bit of drama, because it's the the it's very much linked to to the um, the overall ambition of of the framework, where I, I mean you would see a, a match between the ambition of the framework and and the the resources that were committed to implement it. Um, in terms of outcomes, um, I would like to highlight that we have a goal in the framework that um, on the on the means of implementation, which includes uh, an agreement on what is the the financing gap. I mean, what, what is what is the money missing for for being able to reach the objectives of the framework, uh, which is then set at seven hundred billion dollars uh, per year. Uh, but we also have a target, number 18, that recognizes that if we manage to identify and shift harmful subsidies uh, away from practices that harm biodiversity, uh, we can reduce the need for direct and additional finance by 500 uh, billion US dollars per year. I mean, these are estimates, of course, but um, still. So in target 19, another highlight of this framework, and we... we um, 
managed to agree on on a target uh, for the finance that needs to be mobilized, and that's 200 billion US dollars uh, to be made available, you know, in a timely and effective and access accessible manner. So that's the highlights I, I would say in terms of resource mobilization in the GPF. But then we also have the decision um, and the, the strategy for resource mobilization, which describes a little bit more about how um, to, um, to go about this. And it has it includes, for example, a decision on, on to establish a dedicated trust fund under the Global Environment Facility um, to be dedicated to, to um, issues of biodiversity. Uh, and there's also a decision to, to um, explore the need for maybe an additional international mechanism for finance. So in terms of, you know, the good and the bad, the strengths and, and the challenges, uh, I think it's very good uh, that Target 19 with, the, with the, um, the 200 billion target specifies that this money needs to come from all sources. Um, this is domestic resource mobilization, it's um, investment from, from private sector, etc., uh, as well as international flows such as uh, ODA. But it's not limited to that and that's, that's necessary because really it's, it's, uh, it requires a lot more finance than, than is available in, in uh, ODA only. And I think also strength is that we have this target 18 on, on harmful subsidies um, because that's really something that can help us change practices uh, and shift, um, um, yeah, shift how we do things which, and reduce the pressures uh, on the loss of biodiversity uh, more than investment in conservation and restoration could ever do. Um, and then just finally a, a challenge I think is that the, it's going to take some time to uh, establish this trust fund. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a, a vehicle for, for sort of quick start funding um, but it's still going to take a little bit of time and if then we move into to a process where, where a decision is made eventually uh, in the upcoming COP to establish yet another facility or fund for, for finance that will certainly take a number of years. Um, and that's time that we don't really have as we need to get to, to action uh, as fast as possible. I'll stop there and uh, leave whatever else I could say to if there are any questions. Thank you, Anna, very much for giving us an overview of the discussion on resource mobilization, but also pointing out the, the positive aspects, the strength, but also the, the challenge as well. Um, now I would direct the question to Ramson. Um, Ramson is leading the research program at the Indigenous Movement for Peace Advancement and Conflict Transformation Impact in Kenya. And he works with indigenous peoples and local communities, traditional knowledge, cultures, and protection of the rights to land, territories, and natural resource. He has, deeply, uh, has been deeply engaged in the CBD negotiations and discussions. And he also was active in the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, IFB. So Ramson, uh, welcome. And um, we would like you to highlight about the outcomes of the negotiations, the strength and the challenge from the perspective of indigenous peoples and local communities. Thank you, Ramson. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Anna. I hope you can hear me. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I, I think I'll go back a bit to the first speaker, uh, Koji, when he was introducing this, he said uh, this was a long process. There was many years of negotiations around uh, the CBD and the CBD issues. And um, I think uh, as IPLCs, um, we have participated, yes, in many years. But uh, one thing that I can take from uh, the recent uh, global biodiversity framework is that uh, it's so different than the other negotiations you can see. Uh, as um, there is more and more recognition of the indigenous peoples and local communities and also um, other groups such as women and youth, uh, there's more recognition now, uh, at least in the last GPF negotiations than uh, the other negotiations. And um, uh, I think uh, this has also been contributed by a lot of partners that are now like uh, that are now talking more on the issues of IPLCs, women and youth, 
uh, in the negotiation and also in different other platforms and, uh, such as this one and others that are being organized uh, with IPLCs, uh, Women at Youth. And at the end of the day, uh, in the beginning, when we were discussing about the GBF goals and targets, uh, as well as the monitoring framework, you could see that uh, there were some um, parties that were not really very supportive. But at the end of the day, uh, we really came out with uh, a very inclusive GPF that uh, we really uh, believe that if implemented, it is going to be um, it is going to achieve the priorities for nature, and also uh, it's going to. It's, it's an inclusive document in protecting nature and biodiversity and also uh, supporting people to living uh, to coexist with nature. So um, that is really what I can say. And I think it's also inclusive in terms of all targets. Uh, one of the texts too that I can say, there is a, a very strong voice that's coming, the small groups, indigenous people, some local communities, women and youth, are also joining and are coming with strong statements together whenever they are supporting issues. They also come into the allies and the countries that are supporting to really negotiate on the right language to come in. So I think there is also that strong uh, collaboration and networking with uh, the smaller groups and also uh, the people that uh, the, the other organizations that we are working with. Um, and maybe finally, the other thing that uh, uh, was a highlight is that there were some targets, that, some key targets of priority <coughs> that uh, um, IPLCs and other groups were so keen into following, such as uh, target 3, 15, some targets. They, they, you, you could see they could drill more and more attention uh, than all the rest of the targets. And I think it was also good because at the end of the day, uh, we all came into a language that's so inclusive of everyone. We are achieving the 30% of the earth, but you are still respecting the rights of indigenous people and local communities, yeah. respecting the youth and yeah. Uh, I don't think if I should go to the challenges now. <laughs> Wait for it later, but uh, yeah. That's what I would say now, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Ram. So you can have uh, the time also to speak about the challenges and implementation on our second round. But um, thank you for highlighting the inclusiveness of the GBF and the recognitions of the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and pointing out the specific targets that were very important uh, and positive. Um, so now I'm going to Pranila. So Pernilla is my colleague at SWEDBio, as you have a long experience of engagement in the international biodiversity process, following the CBD for over 20 years, bridging policy and practice, and experiencing um, working closely with indigenous peoples and local communities, but also part of the Swedish delegation, having this both standpoint. So, um, what would you like to highlight about the process of the negotiations, but the important outcomes, strengths, and challenges of the new global biodiversity framework? Thank you, Anna Carolina. I think that um, listening to my colleagues here in the panel, uh, there is, um, well, I, I can uh, see points in what you're saying, everyone. So we have, I think, together cover a lot of what to say, but just to stress of the time perspective. I mean, um, when we get, go back the 10 years to, or 12 years, in fact, to the adoption of the AG target, we actually couldn't imagine that we have this, would see this inclusion of human rights-based approaches of, uh, uh, women equality and women coming into policy making and the youth and intergenerational um, perspective and the transformative education, etc. That we, I think, one of the highlight is really that we have managed to uh, realize that we cannot save biodiversity without engaging people without engaging the society that 
we are all nurturing biodiversity and some actors are quite critical for, for helping out with this. Uh, we have even actually in the target 22, which uh, many have referred to, that is about the participation of uh, indigenous peoples and local communities, women and girls, youth, um, uh, and uh, people with disabilities, but also environmental and human rights defenders, which are like very much on the front line of helping us to protect biodiversity. I think it's an amazing perspective to see all this happening. And I think that the process that all of you um, in the panel before me have actually mentioned that come from the COP14 in Egypt, where we agreed upon having um, a process that should be uh, inclusive, transformative, um, transparent, gender responsive. I mean, all this hope we had for the process. We have very much managed to get there. And thanks to that, we have this uh, very robust framework. And I also, like several have mentioned this, that we had some extra time. Although it was an exceptional challenge, we have also managed to include more participation. This is both about the government, as Charlotte mentioned, but also for the IIFB, with taking advantage of this to really mobilize more people in the local organizations to get into global actions and seminars each, month, each week to discuss the issues. And just the thing I think is to go back to this that we have, well, yes, even, even the women actually with the global plan of action, which was a great process to follow. Um, and the target uh, 23 coming as a complement, which is about gender equality and inclusion of women. But that we have this package of six decisions in place, uh, which covers not only the framework, but also the monitoring that we have indicators in place, that we have uh, planning, a decision on planning, uh, implementation reporting, which we hadn't for the HE target, uh, and that we got also a recognition of the human rights-based approach for the implementation of everything of this. I think this, this, uh, the robustness in this package is like the hope we have for uh, getting this framework to really be implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Pernilla. Thank you for highlighting also the six decisions and how important and, and comparing how it's uh, moving towards a transformative uh, moment. So to continue with the second part of this event, uh, we will focus on the implementation of the Cumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, Stefan. Stefan, it's with you. Hi, everyone. Well, it was a great privilege, right, to hear such a feast of insights, which I don't think are available elsewhere. And we're going to move um, to talk about implementation in a second. But before we do that, we just want to turn the um, attention to our amazing audience as well. So what's happening in your brains as you, as you hear this uh, stuff um, from our panel? And also, I mean, what, what knowledge and experiences are you bringing to this situation? So to do that, we're going to do a Mentimeter. Um, maybe you've come across this before. If not, basically how it works is you go and you click on the, the link in the chat, or you can use your phone if you go to menti.com, and then you input that code that you see on the screen now, so 71898243. And basically what we're asking you is to just quickly and uh, succinctly think about, well, from your perspective, what do you think needs to happen next in order to drive transformative change? Because now we're starting to talk about implementation. That's what the next section is going to be about. So tell us what needs to happen now. 
And uh, I do want to encourage you as well what, during this uh, moment to just get up and have a stretch if you need to, like a move around, get some oxygen um, before we get going again with the panel discussion. Some nice answers coming in already. whole range of different stuff. It'll be interesting to compare this to what is mentioned in the framework itself and in the accompanying reporting and so on. But actually, we're going to move on now because time is moving really fast and we want to give you as much um, yeah, rich insight as possible from the panel. So we're now going to move on to our section on implementation. And we're going to have a slightly different format from what we had before. So we're going to start uh, with hearing from our civil society and Indigenous peoples representatives, Amelia, Ramson and Panilla. And basically what we want to know when we talk about implementation, so maybe you can share with us. So we've got the framework itself, right, and the actions that will be now taken in the name of the framework. But then on the other hand, we've also got the effects of those actions and those aren't necessarily you know everything that we would want to happen and so on so the question i have for you is well based on the outcomes and challenges that you've already pointed out how can we ensure the implementation of the framework becomes a vehicle to get to that transformative uh you know uh, change that we get to that harmonious society that thrives with nature that we're no longer at war with nature as uh, antonio Guterres says so um let's start with amelia Please take it away. Yes, uh, to answer this question, I have uh, three concrete points. One is that we need to update our national instruments as soon as possible. And by updating this, uh, the, let's say the NBSAPs, uh, we need to make sure that they include clear, achievable, and measurable gender equality and biodiversity targets. Like by when all countries update their NBSAPs, they should try to focus on, try to make them as more responsive to gender issues, but also to all human rights, um, all human rights aspects that have been mentioned by the panel previously. And one also, one thing that we have been discussing within, within the calculus is the possibility of having national gender action plans, because we have the global one, but that and it and it is like it it went like a long way because it has already actions like specific actions specific deliverables specific uh, potential actors or implementers but we know that since it's a global framework not necessarily adopts or adapts to all of the all of the realities so it it will be better if all the, all of the countries they have their own gender action plan as well as, or in parallel with their MBSAPs. The second point to make this, uh, the, this GBF a reality is to, and this has been also uh, discussed by the CALCOS, is to avoid false solutions like biodiversity offsets that, like, unfortunately, is part of the, of the, or of the GBF, and also to avoid credits with long-term severe negative consequences. And instead of that, to ensure that any resource mobilization is done as long as human rights, gender justice, and intergenerational equity provisions are fully integrated, meaning that we need secure financial support and direct access to resources for women, particularly indigenous and local women, and to allocate a specific and sufficient funding for implementing the gender, the gender plan of action, because we know we need to remember that this plan of action is kind of voluntarily because it's 
is a, in a parallel instrument to the GBF. So we need the countries to make their own effort to mobilize their own resources, like domestic and internationally, to implement all of these uh, instruments. And the third uh, in, and the third element that I want to mention to make the GBF uh, a reality is that we need to measure. Uh, we know that the that the indicators are something that hasn't been fully uh, defined. So we still have uh, some opportunity to make these uh, indicators as much as uh, possible, like uh, to reflect all of these human uh, rights considerations and to also to document, recognize, monitor and measure the contributions on women, of women and girls to biodiversity and to the three objectives of the convention and how women and girls are also contributing to all of the targets, not only to document the 23 in terms of gender equality, but to document how we are uh, supporting, let's say, the, the target on pollution, the target on, on, uh, on invasive alien species, on, on spatial planning. You know? like we need to make sure that all of these targets are actually uh, documenting how all of the society is contributing to, towards it. And I will leave it here so we have uh, more time to discuss in the, in the questions and to hear from the other colleagues. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay, so Ramson, the same question to you, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, one of the strengths that I will take away from the GBF is um, it's a step in the right direction and um, coming up with uh, an inclusive document that uh, looks into uh, all things in totality is really something that we can say if we implement it, uh, we are going into the right direction. And I think uh, the other thing uh, which uh, my colleague also Amalia have mentioned is uh, now the action plans because for the implementation of the GBF as long as we're as much as we're looking at the global level we should also look into the uh, countries because each country needs now to come up with an inclusive action plan that uh, really gives everyone uh, a responsibility uh, from the government uh, the CSOs and also the people of, of, of each country, the indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as other citizens that live into this, in the cities, and also uh, come up with, uh, with this inclusive action plan that uh, really uh, puts forward the uh, GBF goals. And um, I think um, the other thing, uh, one of the worries is um, one of the worries is about the funding. People, everyone is talking about the funding, but uh, uh, for me, the, there is really something that people also need to realize that there are some things that it does not really require funding to, but uh, it requires, there are quite a lot of benefits that are there in the communities, for example. Uh, people protecting nature for their own livelihood benefits, but not uh, in terms of the, the fund. They do not require funding to, to, to do it, but they just need some kind of support in terms of putting, like, uh, sustainably using uh, the approaches that they have been using. Some are outdated uh, or, or are beaten up by events such as uh, climate change, rain is changing, and you know, so many other things. But uh, at least if, if communities are supported, some things really do not need uh, funds to be there to realize the benefits of nature. So those also should be realized um, because they are not realized. And then um, the other thing, uh, the, the framework also recognizes the, the use of traditional knowledge. I think that also needs to be so much uh, promoted in terms of uh, documentation, um, in terms of uh, regeneration to other uh, other generations that are coming was uh, we really worry that when we lose this uh, when we lose this tra traditional knowledge quite a lot will be impacted in it so um, that's also an opportunity and uh, i'm also very happy that uh, like at the way jay is realizing this and uh, trying to move it forward so um and then again, like gender is also very important, access and benefit sharing, you know, for all those advantages that uh, we can look into. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ramson. So many interesting points there. A lot to, for our audience to think about and to discuss. So, Penela, we don't have so much time, I'm afraid, but could you just uh, complement what's been said by your colleagues? Yes. I, thank you very much. I um, think I am a b good bridge over to the um, official party actors because I am both working with indigenous peoples and local communities on the women's network, but also working on these issues in the Swedish delegation. So I would say that I can completely agree that now the most critical thing is to get the NBSAPs, the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action place, Plans in place. And there I think that the bottleneck is really to activate all actors in society. It means both the governmental actors, the different, uh, I mean what we call mainstreaming in sectors, and uh, also the uh, well, indigenous peoples and local communities, I mean, women and youth, I mean, and including universities and so on. But uh, for, for making this happen, we need the people on the ground. And then with the finance, of course, one issue is to get sufficient funding in place. But if we don't manage to place the funding where it's most needed, it would either not happen anything. So a challenge for everyone who work with funding is now to secure that we have measures to ensure that the funding is reaching local level and in a way that make it easy to promote the right things. Uh, and I also think that one promising thing is that we have a strong evidence base recognized now in IPES, which already have uh, included indigenous and local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and that is a strength that we also now in Fro Target 21 and in the monitoring will be able to keep this on track, which is also a challenge to ensure that we have the human rights, the equity, and the full and effective participation and the traditional knowledge uh, uh, covered in the monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks to all three of you for providing such specific and concrete uh, points. So now we're going to invite the other panelists in. And the way we structured this is that these are folks that have worked more with directly with government. Um, so. The question I have for you is based on that work that you've been doing, on your experiences. Um, yeah, again, about implementation, how can we ensure that this implementation follows that path to achieve the transformational change on the national and international level that we need? So let's start with Carlotta, please. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And, uh... Thank you for this opportunity to start off this uh, discussion again. Um, I think that um, we want to achieve a transformative uh, change, but I think that that needs, of course, uh, active involvement of all actors. What we now, if I speak, for instance, as a party representative of Sweden, we have um, given an assignment to one of our agencies, Swedish Environmental Protection Agency to do uh, to have do an analysis and present proposals for an updated Swedish uh, MBSAP. Uh, and uh, we have uh, underlined in our dialogue with the agency that it needs to be follow the all the guidance that is given in this uh, planning report and review decision about the importance to involve all sectors that is needed. Of course, we have very little time before we we need to present our update embassy up next year. Uh, so it's uh, even if uh, I think we want to be as inclusive as possible, it's also a challenge to make sure that we do have a, um, I think we, we need to have a target that somehow is uh, directed, is relevant for our circumstances and that actually make change. Uh, so it, I, I, as I see it, I think that we 
now needs to start to do implementation as quick as possible. We need to, to take a start, but I also can see that we most likely need in the, in the following years to come back and to update and to, to increase our efforts in many areas. And that I want to link to maybe to respond to one of the questions from, from the, in the chat when I see that. I think one change, if you compare to our each target, and we do have this decisional planning report in view, we do have a process here that hopefully will help us to do an, an analysis each COP that actually can and make a review of progress that hopefully will help us all to make a better actions. It could maybe have a stronger language than it is, but still we do have a process in place, and I think hopefully this will work as, as it is planned. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Really interesting. And to respond to the questions as well. We're going to have a chance to do that more in a minute. But first of all, so Anna, would you like to speak to that question as well, please? Yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I will speak from, from the CEDA perspective, of course, I mean, as a, um, a government agency. We, we see that we can continue much of the work we're doing in the, in the area of biodiversity, but there will be, of course, some um, um, retro, some introspection going on and some, some changes of that work as well. But I think it certainly will help us a lot to have uh, this new global uh, framework, which is, is a common, it's a global and it's a great framework that brings together us and, and our partner countries and our, our partner organizations. Um, our current support uh, to biodiversity is around 2 billion Swedish kroner. It has been at that level for the past couple of years. And we, uh, we um, support work on biodiversity through both our global thematic strategies as well as, as um, bilateral strategies with, with different countries and, and uh, also support to specific uh, groups of actors like civil society, for example. And we currently have 45 different strategies. 21 of those uh, contain objectives on biodiversity, which gives us an excellent opportunity to, to uh, look into uh, ways to, to, um, to support this work further. I mean, it's, it's a prerequisite that we have those objectives in the strategies. It's a big change from a couple of years ago when only four of our strategies had objectives on, on biodiversity. Uh, so this is really a, a good a good uh, starting point for us. And we do work currently with um, sort of a four-pronged strategy to strengthen our work on, on biodiversity as an agency. We uh, make sure to integrate uh, biodiversity in all the different contributions in different sectors that we work on. We look to, to identify new uh, targeted contributions that will support both restoration and sustainable use of biodiversity. And we work to strengthen our, our dialogue with multilateral organizations and EU and other partner organizations. And I think this global, new global framework is really going to aid that dialogue and, and make it more focused. Um, and fourthly, we also look at how we can con contribute to, to uh, leveraging um, investments from, from private actors into biodiversity. And it's fairly easy, it has been fairly easy in the past to do that in terms of ensuring that investments are uh, not causing harm to biodiversity, but we want to take that work further because we want to ensure that if we um, leverage financing or investment, uh, that it has a positive contribution to, to sustainable use of biodiversity and, and restoration as well. And I mean, looking at the new framework, I mean, we see that there are several targets that we already um, do uh, contribute to in many ways. But in the coming months, of course, we're, we started already. We will continue that work to look into how, you know, both our ongoing collaborations and possible uh, new uh, collaborations can, can further contribute to, to the implementation of these targets. And I'm thinking, for example, of the target 10 on agriculture and, and forestry, et cetera, and, and the sustainable use in the sectors. We have a lot of work going on, but there are certainly ways that we could tweak or fine tune or, or make additions to, to the projects and contributions that we're working on. Um, another one is target 14 on, on um, integrating biodiversity in policy and regulation and planning. Um, the sector of environmental governance is one of the, the major sectors that we uh, in which we support biodiversity. 
um, and there are also should be the openings for supporting the updating of NBSAFs, for example, that was mentioned by by uh, Amelia, for example, and I think also um, in different ways, ensuring that the implementation of this framework can be done in an uh, inclusive way. Uh, and certainly uh, the targets on, on gender is something that we will um, continue looking at how we can uh, integrate as well. But it's, it's uh, work that will involve a lot of people and continue uh, for, for some time ahead. Mm -hmm. So I will stop there for now. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing. That was really interesting. So Koji, um, you, your work with the Japanese government, would you like to share something about what they have in mind, um, please? And just quickly, if you don't mind, because we're running a little bit out of time. Sure, thanks, Stephen. So I'd like to uh, share one example that what, uh, what Japanese government is trying to do. So along with many other targets, Japanese government is uh, uh, I, I, as, I, as I have observed, Japanese government is trying to put special focus on the target three of the new, new framework, uh, conserving the, at least thirty percent of the terrestrial and then coastal marine areas. Uh, the area, especially the areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services. So, Japanese government proposed the uh, Satya initiative at the COP10 uh, when uh, it was held in Aichi, Japan in 2010. Uh, so Satyam initiative was uh, um, aimed for uh, spreading the Japanese traditional concept of Satyama to the world as Japan uh, established such area uh, which have been managed sustainably in a uh, long time in our history. So the vision of Satoyama is like societies in harmony with nature. And it's a model of areas that are traditionally formed through the practice of sustainable agriculture, forestry, and fisheries in Japan. So we, so the terrestrial area of Japan is uh, the seventy percent of the terrestrial area is covered by forests, like Sweden. So, uh, and then there are so many small villages around Japan, uh, which have managed to survive uh, in a sustainable way, living with harmony, living in harmony with nature. So, there are many villages though, like those, but uh, in in the last hundred years, uh, because of this uh, global market and economic, uh, economic cent uh, centered uh, society, uh, urbanization have been occurring around Japan and depopulation aging are serious issues in those rural areas. So uh, therefore, uh, Japanese government is trying to put more attention on those areas and then to manage those areas. So trying to um, finance those areas to manage forests in a sustainable way and trying to attract more young people to the area in this manner. Uh, they want to uh, cover those rural areas as OECMs. In this way, uh, uh, they are expecting that to achieve the target three, 30 by 30, especially for the uh, territory area. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, if anyone is uh, interested in knowing a bit more about the Satoyama, they can um, find information online. Koji, maybe you can share a link in the chat, but you can also actually see Satoyama in the Studio Ghibli movies. So that's one way in which you can learn more about it. Right, so we're going to turn now to the rest of the um, panel. So thanks, everyone, for staying with us. And we've heard so many interesting and specific ideas, um, reflections, and insights. So now it's time for the Q&A. So don't go away, because now we get the chance to answer your questions. Um, Anna, do you want to come with our first question, please? 
Yeah, sure. Um, we have one question from the audience, and I think it, uh, we could have a little bit of uh, a reflection of all our panelists. So the question is, um, um, some indigenous peoples and local community groups have uh, manifested that there is a considerable uh, risk of eviction and human rights violation with the kind of um, financial mechanism and conservation incentives that we have in the GBF. So like, for example, the debt, debt swaps, blue and green bones, they have already shown controversial effects. So how can we secure the decentralization of this financial resource to reach IPLCs, indigenous peoples and local communities directly and not end up um, centralizing the funds and the same uh, uh, in, in NGOs, environmental NGOs, like how to guarantee transparency and rights in this process when business actors and profit making are an important part of the new finance mechanism. I think it's a um, very key question and um, perhaps we can start a little bit um, with Ramson and uh, well we can follow the other with the ones who would like to speak as well. Uh, just a brief reflection on if you would like to. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think this is a very uh, many times asked question and I think um, when I always see this question, I go back to the uh, origin of conservation and what's known as maybe protected areas, because I think that's where the whole program, uh, problem begins. And to me, I think uh, before even we look into where finances go, we should first of all look into how we protect. Because um, if we don't look into how we protect, then I think uh, that's where we start going wrong, because we start separating nature with people, and I think uh, the people will be um, facing a lot of challenges of eviction because um, the earlier narratives of conservation is creating parks that people do not exist in those parks. Um, and of course, when we talk about increase of those areas and such, uh, we will definitely be talking about evict people and then the uh, kind of finance that are coming, they are coming to protect areas without people. So I think that's the first challenge uh, when it comes to conservation and protected areas and protecting human rights approaches. The other thing is, uh, yes, of course, when we look at funding, they stuck somewhere. They don't really impact the real people who are doing the real work in the, uh, on the ground. And I think yeah, mechanisms should be uh, developed as well to make sure that their finances go all the way down to the indigenous peoples and local communities directly. Because in most cases, um, there's also an allied capture, there is uh, an, an NGO capture, uh, which still uh, controls the money from going all the way down to the indigenous peoples and local communities that are there with nature and protecting nature. So I think um, there are quite a lot of examples that uh, people are coming up with, uh, such as uh, uh, the reversing the flow from the Netherlands government that was really presented recently, even in the G in, during the GPF, GPF, GPF negotiations, that it's trying to uh, bring the money to the very, very grassroots. Reversing the flow is not water. It's actually like we reverse the narratives. Instead of giving the organizations the money, you try to ask those organizations that always receive their money to recognize the groups that are there on the ground and then you give them to implement exactly what they feel like they should implement and not also to be corrupted in a way that they should Im implement. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that will also uh, maybe bring a backward narrative of supporting the communities to stay and protect nature on their benefits and the benefits of our life that they are always staying with. Uh, that will also uh, control and the kind of uh, capture. And then I think the other thing is quite a lot of things also needs to be looked at uh, when it comes to species uh, pro protection. Uh, it's a very big problem, for example, when you are talking about protection of rhinos, you know, those are like it's now species. So you are, you are getting funds that uh, they are going to protect species and it's one species and not inclusive on an area. And it's the same case also when we talk about funding, we should also be talking about inclusive landscapes, not the forests, not the grasslands, but inclusive also of the deserts. 
the one uh, thing that we also need to look at is uh, those areas that do not have biodiversity now had biodiversity at one point in life. So we should also try in terms of uh, putting funds there to rehabilitate, to also make sure that we disperse and not bring people to um, certain areas. When it comes to businesses, uh, because I think businesses are also uh, things that are really controlling and uh, are really making uh, people to violate, uh, making businesses to violate rights. I think uh, there is, there should also be approaches where the communities also own those businesses or, or co-own the businesses with the investors. And uh, when building the capacity, like you're saying, you're building the capacity of communities, it should be it should not be uh, you building the capacity of the communities for centuries of years. I think it should also have a strategy of when the community have the, the capacity, the investors now will move out and leave the communities to run the businesses. And so they should also come up with strategies of putting these fun, funds um, of investing in nature into control by communities in the implementation at the long run. Okay. Thank you, Ramson. So there was a question from Neil uh, Dawson that I think is really important to answer, uh, ask. Uh, and that's about accountability, especially when we think about the kind of inclusiveness and the progressiveness of the framework. But how can, the act how can states and funders and so on be held accountable to make sure that that actually takes place in the timescale that matters? Um, is there someone that would like to take that question about accountability? Carlotta, would you like to say something about can, how can we hold state accountable? Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm the closest one. I, I was just, uh, well, um, first, I, I, I think that, um, as you know, this convention uh, itself doesn't have a compliance uh, system. I mean, we do have under the both Katarina and Nagoya Protocol compliance committees, but it has been ve very often. Um, raised during the negotiations we need for different capabilities and we need to have um, support. So every time we have uh, something that needs to be done by parties and others is always raised the issue of the need for capacity building and um, uh, different national circumstances and so on. I think it's quite important that as I see a step forward is that we do have a system of planning report in view and hopefully the global analysis that will be done if ever to COP and then we do have a global review every time we'll some put the spot on what's actually done by the parties. If parties needs to come up with the presentation, uh, how they fulfill the targets, they also need to say what they're doing. And hopefully that will put the pressure on some kind of political pressure. And I think that could be quite important, especially so some for some parties that you do have is, um, is highlight of what is done and that maybe it was not done. So um, even if there is no compliance in that sense that you can punish parties that are not done, I still believe that, that um, when we did this, uh, we came to this agreement in Montreal, um, everybody wants to somehow to achieve the targets, but it's, it's a package, it's also linked to all the need of capacity building, resources and other means of implementation as well. I mean, maybe I can hand over to someone, somebody else in the panel to respond. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, Amelia, if you wanted to compliment what was Carlotta was saying. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, I think that for, uh, from our side, what we have been discussing is that, as, uh, as Charlotte was saying, is like maybe through the monitoring framework is a, a way of trying to, make, to not have the, the countries accountable, but at least to know what they are doing, how they are doing and uh, how are they progressing on the implementation. And that's why we were mentioning the need of having gender responsive indicators on our side, no? and like, because we know that what, what, it, what is not going to be measured is not gonna be do done. So that's the need of having a super strong monitoring framework. And I guess that that's why also the, the, the COP itself decided to have a bit more time to, to finish it and to, to all the, 
I, I mean, all the, all, the, all the other indicators. So I think that's one way of, of doing it. I keep track of what we are doing, the governments and all of the society. Okay, I will just go forward if that's all right. We have another question about uh, science, how research and science is used as part of the negotiations. And I was wondering if Panillo or Anna would like to comment on that, how you have seen uh, science and also, I mean, other kinds of knowledge too, right? If you'd like to just comment on how that informs the negotiations process and just really quickly if you can, because <laughs> we're wrapping up now. Okay, I say something quickly. Uh, I think that it's a strong progress in itself that we now have IPES as the evidence base, which is actually recognized in, in the first part of the framework and, and um, the drivers of biodiversity loss accepted, both the direct and the indirect drivers. Uh, and that we also throw IPES, but also in the program of work through Articulate J and Target 21 have a strong recognition of traditional knowledge, is to say the indigenous and local knowledge, which IPES have been working closely to find methods to integrate as equally valid and with integrity of the knowledge system, which is actually what you really need as it is on the ground. Um, this with um, the balance between being a negotiator and scientist, I think actually in delegation, it's positive to have scientists. They, I mean, they, they can then also advise in place those who are present. Um, and we also have, of course, other scientists and the IIFB, the Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities, the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity present as holders of knowledge. Uh, so I think that we actually have a better informed framework and that the monitoring system is also a way now of recognize the need for bringing in continuously knowledge and update what we see need to be done. And that is also about the social science, of course, the, the study of, of uh, how right-based approaches and, and uh, the methods to bring in people as uh, equally valid is present. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Anna, is there anything you'd like to quickly add? Uh, Penilla said it really well. Um, I could just add that, I mean, for the issue of resource mobilization as well, even though um, not the same kind of science perhaps, but there, there were several reports uh, going into those discussions made by both researchers, uh, intergovernmental organizations and civil society organizations. So a lot of, of evidence to, to back up the numbers. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, okay, Anna, over to you. Okay, uh, I think we're just uh, passing the time here, but uh, we have amazing questions in the chat and uh, please feel free uh, to send us an email if you have any doubt and later on we can see if uh, we're able to forward to any of the panelists. Uh, um, if it's able to. So I just would like to thank everyone for attending and engaging and the, the chat is very, very rich, a lot of questions. We could stay here for more than one hour. And also thank you for engaging the discussion. Thank you all the panelists, a special thank you for the panelists and also the organizing team behind the backs on WhatsApp chats and working as well. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Goodbye Thank for now. You. Bye.